I believe it was a little less than a year ago when I stumbled upon this promising looking indie horror game in the making. I think I saw the horror games community Twitter account share a trailer of it that got me to check it out and after watching it and reading through the Steam page, it pretty much instantly hooked me. Beautiful, surreal and morbid banner art, vibrant, detail rich and very homogeneously crafted pixel art style and the promise of a psychological horror tale that might feel like a lost relic discovered in Satoshi Khan's drawers. Extremely my thing. I mean, yeah, any piece of media that describes its atmosphere unironically as phantasmagorical has my attention in a heartbeat, so I pretty much went straight on my wishlist. It had initially been planned for release in 2022, but then later that year was moved to the 31st of May of 2023, which is, hey, just a couple of days ago. So I was already looking forward to the release, had played the demo, which had convinced me to probably get it on launch already, <laughs> had even done some thumbnail mockups in case I ended up deciding to do a video on it when it comes out, and then developer studio Atelier QBD just nonchalantly announced out of the blue that, oh, uh, yes, by the way, uh, Akira Yamaoka has contributed a full 10 tracks to the already incredibly catchy and charming soundtrack by French electro duo Fleur et Bleu. No biggie. It's like, wow, like, are you kidding me? So yeah, still dazzled by these news, try to picture my reaction when they reached out to me not all too long ago and asked me if I was interested in playing an early copy of the game and making a video on it pretty much day one. Oh my god! Well, yeah, sign me up. Decondition released just a few days ago, like from this video's release, and I've already played it, finished it, experienced it, enjoyed it, and suffered through it. Not because it's bad, but because its story really goes in some deeply unsettling territory. More on that we'll of course get into across the length of this video. But yeah, full transparency here, as you might have guessed, this video is sponsored by the developer. And when it comes to that, I have two very strict requirements for even considering doing a sponsored dedicated video on video games. The game itself has to be something I'd already consider covering outside of sponsorship, which very much the case for Decarnation and I must get full editorial freedom, so no gag orders or restrictions on giving honest, including negative criticism, and as well as no mandatory pre-written talking points of praise. I find it genuinely unsettling how common these requirements are with sponsored videos on video games on YouTube. Requiring influencers to omit anything that's not exclusively positive on a game they cover for money, it's... Uh, whatever. Anyway. Atelier QBD said they were completely cool with my requirements and even specifically asked to exclusively give honest feedback, which it will be my pleasure. So one last thing before we get going, let's talk about spoilers and what to expect. The game just came out, so I'll be doing my darndest to keep this video as low on narrative spoilers as I can, and we'll focus more on things like game design, writing, art style, music, pacing, themes, and any other personal observations I feel are worth sharing without unraveling the entire plot in front of you. But having played it, and being still in the process of digesting it, this is a game that has so much going on that's worth unpacking that I'm also really eager to dig at least a little bit deeper into themes. So here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to try to keep things as spoiler free as possible, both in terms of the plot points I discuss and the things I show from the game. Like, in the beginning, for instance, I will largely brush on story beats and show footage from the publicly available demo, but not more. But over time, I'll be digging a little deeper into themes, narrative, etc., and also end up discussing and showing more parts past the first act, while still trying to keep spoilers to a minimum. The game is still very fresh in my mind, and it's laden with layers upon layers of things to discuss and take apart, so normally I'd let this simmer in my mind for months before even considering to get down to write on it and analyze it, but in this case, I'm gonna give you my steaming hot, fresh out of the oven, unfinished, extremely stream of consciousness, raw and undigested first impression of decarnation, trying to paint you as broad a picture as I can so you can decide for yourself if this sounds like a game for you or not. So as a general rule of thumb when it comes to spoilers, I'd say if you're someone who prefers to jump into a game as untainted as possible, then if at any point you feel like, okay, you know what, I want to play this, then stop the video and hop right over to the Steam page and then come back once you've finished it. It would be lovely though if you'd let the video run in the background to give me that sweet view time with the Eldritch algorithm gods. Just saying. On that note, if you want to avoid visual spoilers, because I'll be showing a lot of footage across these 40-50 minutes, I don't know how long, I always write my videos so that they can also be enjoyed as a podcast format only, so without any visuals. So if you prefer that, that's also an option. Sound good? 
All right, then let's not waste any more time and turn the clocks back three decades and travel back to Paris in the late 80s and plunge into the wonderfully grotesque, artistic, cerebral, the phantasmagorical, psychological war tale of Decarnation. Decarnation is a narrative-focused, psychological horror adventure that engages with a host of complicated emotions and heavy themes through the lens of 29-year-old cabaret dancer Gloria, whose life is approaching a dramatic turning point in more than one way. Her story begins in 1989, the very year, by the way, in which the Belgian techno anthem Pump Up the Jam by Technotronic was released. Gloria, who has been a dancer in the variety business for over a decade, a decade across which she has managed through hard work and dedication to eke out the level of fame and recognition in the cabaret scene of Paris, finds that her clock has been ticking louder and louder in recent years. In a business that's heavily centered around physical appearance, youth and the gaze of the audience, Gloria lives in denial over the looming threat of her career entering the downward trajectory of entropy before younger talent will unavoidably come in and swoop away her place in the spotlight. At the beginning of the game, we find her in a sculptor's atelier, posing to be turned into a bronze statue of her likeness, before everything starts falling apart, as Petrus quite overtly alludes, a thought that Gloria quite perturbedly tries to not engage with at all. This opening scene really gives a wonderful first impression at how decarnation plays with the audience's expectations. As a game whose subject revolves around the themes of gaze, exploitation, and objectification, this first shot starting out with seeing the main character completely naked on a plain black canvas plays a clever bait and switch. Because it makes players uncertain if the game will explore these themes or if it is one of those that go down the road of equally serving them to the audience. But there are many writerly and artistic choices across this game that I can say that it luckily never goes into exploitatory territory for the audience. If that were the case, I feel the developers would have likely picked a less stylized, less cartoony and chibi art style and direction. To the contrary, in its opening hour and beyond that, especially along the length of the prologue, which can be played as a demo on Steam, Decarnation goes to great lengths to make the players empathize with Gloria as a person as much as they can, to feel for her situation, put herself in their shoes, understand her struggles, and pretty quickly get a sense of the perils she's facing in her life from all sides, basically, and inside. Every close person around her, be it in a professional or personal capacity, treats her in a different shade of, I know better what's good for her, and we quickly find how Gloria struggles to get people to actually hear her, hear what she's saying, a pattern that, over many years of her life of constant exposure, made her develop a mask for true thoughts and feelings more and more in front of others, until she had completely lost any sense of how she is without the mask. Gloria visits the museum for the exhibition of the statue made in her likeness with her girlfriend Joy and we quickly get an impression at how open and direct decarnation is with its symbolism and metaphor straight out of the door most of the time. Just like the quite obvious hints by the sculptor in the first scene, the choice of real art exhibits we find and can inspect at the museum, and the comments Gloria makes on them are really not subtle in establishing at least one of the many themes that the game's narrative will be heavily centered around from this point out. When she enters the room with a statue, the central exhibit, she is appalled by finding some creepy stranger apparently touching and groping her bronze likeness in very unseemly ways, and for some reason realizes that it feels exactly as if this was done to her directly. She's stricken by panic and all but flees the place, with her partner showing very little tact and empathy for the state she is in. We return to the museum not much later, albeit when Gloria is subconsciously processing the happenings of the day, her sleep, and the place immediately feels different in subtle ways. Movement and scrolling is subtly more languid and slow, and Gloria's comments on the exhibitions are unmasked, like to use Freudian terms, as if her perception of the waking world is seen through the obfuscated lens of her highly conflicted superego, while here in the Lynchian dream state, her id blabbers straight and unfiltered. Decarnation's pretty upfront about the fact that its story will constantly oscillate between the real world and the symbolic, the dream world, the metaphorical layer, the other world, however you want to call it. And this is a fine line to walk. 
I hate to use the term, but this is something that can very easily feel pretentious and clumsy, like a writer wanting to say, hey, I'm writing psychological horror, and look how deep my story is. Here is symbolism, and, and there is a metaphor. Here, let me spell it out for you how smart I am by using symbolism, blah, 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 blah. In my opinion, this commonly happens when metaphors, symbolism, and lore are employed solely for their own sake, without making the primary focus of any scene the emotions a situation conveys to characters, audience, etc. Symbolism, metaphoric language, and so on are great when used as tools to achieve this, to get this across, but that's quite often not how they're used in my experience. But luckily, in Decarnation, this level of upfrontness with its imagery never feels clumsy, but rather like someone playing an open hand with confidence at a poker table. Because A, when the game invokes metaphoric imagery to paint an impression of, for instance, glorious subconscious, the writers, despite using a lot of it, use the stylistic device with precision and deliberation. And this is done to B, play with the expectation it sets up, and then take them away and distort them, blur the lines between the metaphoric, the symbolic, the real and the dream, the conscious and the subconscious to a degree where it becomes hard for the player, as it is for Gloria, to keep up with what is what until you can't tell up from down anymore, thematically. What can easily drift into a gigantic cloud of mixed metaphors instead manages, quite successfully in my opinion, to make players actually walk a mile in Gloria's mentally deranged shoes to get gaslit, gatekept, and girl bossed alongside her, as much as it's possible to achieve considering what she has to go through across the length of the game. It gets pretty damn tough. Like, the demo prologue chapter hinted at things taking a turn for the worse already, but when I finally played the full game, pretty much immediately with the start of chapter 2, I was welcomed by an incredibly unsettling gut feeling when I realized where exactly the story is going to take her. This is tough stuff, but I'll go into a bit more detail about it a bit later. For now, let it just be said that yeah, as someone who plays a lot of horror games and generally consumes a lot of dark and morbid media and has done so over the years, Decarnation pulled me through some very, very uncomfortable emotions. And I'm not saying this as a bad thing, just that the story the game tells the things Gloria goes through are quite hard to digest. But yeah, in a way it's fascinating because the charming pixel art chibi style doesn't quite give this first impression, right? It looks more fun, cartoony, upbeat, and not like something that really turns your stomach at times. But if you're not new to the genre of, um, whatchamacallit, RPG maker style narrative or adventures that go places, you know full well that some of the most notorious entries of this really don't pull their punches. And Decarnation is definitely no exception. But yeah, I call it RPG maker style, but just to clarify, this game wasn't made in RPG maker but in Unity, but follows a similar blueprint to this subgenre of interactive narrative adventure, albeit with its own unique isometric art style. This is definitely one of the things that struck me almost instantly, how expressive and incredibly detailed and also homogenous, overall incredibly well-crafted the art in this game is. Everything on screen, every item, every character has the same signature handwriting. All the isometric sprites and lavish backgrounds were being bombarded with range from colorful, vibrant and expressive to chaotic, surreal and sometimes supremely artistic. And there's many times where I feel like I can see where the inspiration came from, but with such a frequency from so many different directions that it never feels like outright copying anything. It remains its own identity. From Mulholland Drive to Junji Ito to Lovecraft to Cronenberg and onward, Decarnation's surreal art is at times an almost nauseatingly wild accumulation of artistic horror tropes and imagery tossed into a blender and blitzed into a surprisingly homogenous and well-rounded smoothie. There were moments, especially in the surreal otherworldly segments, where I got intense flashbacks to how it felt to play Sanitarium for the first time a long time ago, only hand-drawn in genuinely beautiful pixel art. And so much of the game's story is told through incredibly detailed environmental storytelling. Like Gloria's apartment alone in the beginning already paints a surprisingly detailed picture of her to begin with, but it's astonishing how much is added to that characterization by the many little and big changes and alterations of her apartment over time the many times we revisited across the length of the game. Gameplay-wise, Decarnation plays very akin to many of its genre contemporaries. Think 
for instance, to the moon or Yuminiki when it comes to the blend of moving a character through isometric environments, interactions with objects and talking with characters in it, conversations mostly linearly flowing with the occasional multiple choice moments and the occasional mini game or contextual puzzle to break up the flow, plus a couple of stealth sequences to boot. Although I gotta say that for the most part, the minigames make contextually more sense than in, for instance, To the Moon, a game which I absolutely adore. For example, when embodying Gloria during her work as a stage performer, it makes perfect sense to include a little rhythm game for her occasional dance segments. Whenever she does her stretching exercises, we basically play fishing in Stardew Valley and other variations of quick time events, often to break up the monotony and add a feeling of interactivity and flow. Sometimes it was done really well and charming, like I love the segment in the opening chapter when Gloria takes a shower and it's just a sequence of button prompts. Boop, shower on. Wiggle wiggle, close on. Boop left, boop right, to spread cologne. All alongside the wonderfully catchy soundtrack by Fleury Bleu setting the atmosphere. The game has a good handful of these moments that just for lack of a more sophisticated scientific explanation, just feel really nice. Another instance of these simple little busy work mechanics that I found surprisingly simple yet effective is how the game visualizes a state of sleeplessness, with thoughts flowing as clouds literally left and right coming in while Gloria is twisting and turning on her mattress, keeping her from falling asleep until you just let go and she can drift to sleep. This clever and playful way of toying with the game's systems also extends to how the narrative is scripted in this isometric top-down format. In the opening chapter alone, there's a ton of really clever and playful transitions between scenes, often making great use of negative space on the screen to create the environs, like the long hallway before Gloria's apartment flowing seamlessly into the elevator riding downstairs, or the way the game cuts from the phone call the moment the caller starts giving her instructions of how to get to the agreed meeting point, fading straight over to her when being on the way next day with the instructions popping up as text bubbles. The game is full of these clever little transitions that feel like Edgar Wright got his hands on an RPG Maker copy. They're not just used to look cool, but they often also pack some narrative weight. Lots of subtle juxtapositions and little bits of information that seem harmless at first glance, only to resurface in other places where they shouldn't really be, but finding it exactly where we find it, especially in the otherworldly subconscious realm, a single word dropped or name used in the right place unexpectedly quite often made me suddenly go oof when the narrative gravity hit me straight in the gut. I've also noticed that the game at times uses quick time mechanics in otherwise really clever ways. Like um, okay, how am I gonna explain this without giving anything away? Okay, just hypothetically. Imagine you have a mechanic, like I just showed, where you alternate two keys to quickly fill up a progress bar to simulate a form of physical effort. It's been used a few times across the game, so it's established and understood by the players. This is putting in a physical effort to achieve a task. But it's mostly used for relatively banal things, like getting into your clothes or trying to push a door open. But then imagine there's, say, a character that we as the player have built up an extreme amount of resentment and loathing against over the course of the story. And then, in a really dire situation, we suddenly have to physically struggle against this adversary and get the chance to enact payback against them. And this, simulated by this same mechanic, when you suddenly witness yourself hammer these same keys with hot and furious intensity, it's a really clever way of mirroring the player's emotional state back at them. Like, I'm really trying to keep it at vague posting here as much as I can. It's like, yeah, a game usually has the screen and the speakers to transmit information to the players, but this? really well-placed use of a simple quick time event mechanic is essentially using the player themselves as a canvas to broadcast information back at them. Or hey, another more concrete example for a clever reuse of a mechanic is in the prologue chapter when Gloria just had everything fall apart in her personal life and she starts dancing, trying to keep up the smile. But the mechanics of the rhythm game that was before used on stage now pretty much get impossible to keep up with until Gloria both figuratively and literally loses her composure, the mask of pretense just melting down to the floor.
Anyhow, this praise for the use of QuickTime events is coming from someone who, nine times out of ten, gives QuickTime events a bombastic side-eye by default. Like, not every instance of QuickTime events in this game is like pure game design perfection, but I genuinely enjoyed that it didn't feel like it was used plainly as a throwaway mechanic for padding a linear story out with some interaction to call itself a game, as it is done in so many games, especially during the 2010s height of the QuickTime trend. Jason! The only real criticism I have is that these types of mandatory frantical button mashing mechanics should absolutely come with an accessibility option for those for whom this is a physical or mechanical roadblock due to certain types of handicaps. Definitely something I'd love to see patched in later on. And on that note, I find it quite admirable that the game sports such a detailed content warning given its extremely serious subject matter. More on that later. But something I felt was missing in that list was a warning that the game contains a handful of quite punchy audiovisual jump scares. It's not super often in a way that I personally found it irritating, it's used well, but the game employs imagery, flashes and acoustic stings deliberately meant to startle the players at times in moments of the character's psychological distress, and some of them are executed really effectively, like that's technically a compliment. Like, I'm personally someone who's usually very stoic when it comes to jump scares, and I got got pretty good once or twice. What I'm saying here is, I know from personal experience that there are people for whom this is absolutely anxiety-inducing, potentially highly triggering kryptonite. It's okay to have it in there, but the game, or any game that employs the stylistic device, should provide a clear warning about it. That's my point. The prologue concludes with Gloria already having received blow after blow in her private and personal life, her boss aiming to retire her as a dancer, her mother ever berating her on her poor life choices, the exhibition of her statue having turned into an anxiety-inducing debacle, and at the end, her partner breaking up with her because Gloria is just too good for her. After finding herself at the end of her rope, she accepts an almost deus ex machina lifeline that's being extended to her. Because as it appears, a renowned and wealthy art curator wants to become her patron and fund her own show with a sizable budget. And after initial hesitation, in the state she finds herself, Gloria accepts the offer and makes herself on the way to meet her benefactor at the end of a forest path. Long story short, we hear a story too good to be true. It ain't. <sighs> I do wish that this journey of hers didn't have to go where it went, because, like, the prologue ends here with Gloria being supposedly shot and falling to the floor, and then Act 2 begins with the revelation that she finds herself abducted and locked in a basement, and I can genuinely say that the moment this was revealed, it really made me feel deeply uncomfortable, and that was a feeling that I carried with me for pretty much the entire length of the game. Yeah. Gloria finds herself imprisoned by what turns out to be her quote-unquote greatest admirer, an obsessive stalker who had followed her life for pretty much her entire career, kept tabs on every aspect of her personal life, and now decided to break through the parasocial fourth wall, keeping her captive in a room fit for a princess. She finds herself in a scenario that has the whole brunt of desperation of old boy interspersed with the omnipresent and nauseating threat of sexual violence by an obsessive stalker of perfect blue. And it feels every bit as uncomfortable as it sounds, through and through. Decarnation deals with many different themes like the dark sides of stardom, obsessive fandom, generational trauma, nostalgia, objectification, exploitation, and the unrelentless expiration date of those who came to fame in a carnally explosive and exploitatory industry and all the demons that spawn from it. And in many places it definitely has a noticeable overlap with movies like Perfect Blue by Satoshi Kon or Black Swan by Darren Aronofsky, which is basically a ballet remake of Perfect Blue. <laughs> but unlike Aronofsky, the developers of Decarnation don't weasel around denying, but instead proudly wear their inspirations and influences on their sleeves, with many little nods and references to the works that influenced it scattered throughout its story without them ever feeling flat or unfitting. Like Gloria's club, where she works as a dancer, is called Black Swan. But it's not just a hey, hey, get the reference thing, but it has a heavy metaphoric implication on Gloria's situation, her inner journey she's about to undertake, with a fear of her life and career moving relentlessly toward the swan song, the metaphorical effort or performance given just before death or retirement. 
The phrase refers to an ancient belief that swans sing a beautiful song just before their demise since they have been silent or alternatively not so musical for most of their lifetime. This metaphor has a central place in Gloria's story. It's the very thing that looms over her life, the unavoidable end of all she worked so hard towards, her dreams and aspirations, of the person, the character, the stage presence she invented and cultivated, both physically and literally looming over her during her performances. It's a wonderful example of the way decarnation juggles with symbolism and metaphors, very openly, omnipresently and vividly in your face. And I mean this in a good way. It's really easy to fall into the trap of writing a tale with layers of deep psychological horror and constantly bludgeon the audience over the head with overt use of symbolism in a way that feels like, for lack of a better word, pretentious. Like where you can't help but feel that the writer really wants you to know how smart they are by all the heavy concepts they know and engage with and shove in your face. I never got that feeling from Decarnation, even when the game goes as far as near directly spelling things out for the audience, there's always so much else going on that it never becomes overtly blatant. Because what it does, despite using symbolism and metaphors in many places, it also keeps and keeps on blurring the lines again and again so much that what you initially thought, ah, yeah, clear, this is what that means, eventually becomes so convoluted and obfuscated that you start questioning what's what. Decarnation baits and switches, setting up expectations and, uh, well, subverting them multiple times over throughout the story, with some twists that felt obvious to me from a mile away and others that I wouldn't have expected if you shoved my face right in it. I think that is ultimately why it never felt clumsy or pretentious with its symbolism to me, because it kept successfully blindsiding me. So, of course, I end up second-guessing my initial expectations, right? Now, when I say that this game made me deeply uncomfortable throughout big stretches of time, I truly mean this. But as I said, I don't mean this as a criticism, or that the game and the story it tells is not good or anything. It's just really, really tough stuff. Which is, of course, quite subjective. For someone else, it could be like, meh, whatever. But let's just say that it's a game that sports a generous list of content warnings and the implicit suggestion that if any of these topics here should be difficult or potentially triggering for you to please take these warnings seriously. And I highly agree with that. I also highly appreciate that the game takes the fact that its narrative goes into very dark, very uncomfortable and very mature topics seriously and doesn't treat it with the attitude of your standard emotionally stunted grimdark writer who feels extremely grown up by depicting very gruesome violence against women on screen without doing the slightest bit of research. Gloria goes through several mental and emotional stages of captivity, fluctuating between the furious desire to escape, despair over the realization that escape seems to be an impossibility, and eventually the self-gaslighting act of acceptance of her shackles, arguing herself into the illusion that in here she might after all be safer and better taken care of than in the unrelenting world outside. And the food is better too developing a severe Stockholm Syndrome that even players get to share in over stretches of time. Here's another example of how just a few words placed in the right moment with the right pacing can hit harder than anything you can plot on screen in visceral detail. After her first days of captivity and several failed attempts at finding a way out, the screen fades to black, pauses for a few heavy seconds and then just a small red caption in the bottom left of the screen appears and says, months later. Yeah, as I said, this is rough stuff. And the game is really successful at making the players empathize with Gloria in this horrible situation. For better or worse, we're trapped with her and see the world through her eyes. And it becomes increasingly clear that her grip on reality starts dissipating. It becomes harder and harder to tell apart what's the real and what's the dream world. And for instance, sometimes things we hear in the dream world for the first time then appear in the ostensibly real world after that fact, gaslighting the player's sense of what's now real and what's illusion. The journey she undertakes across the narrative, both real and subconscious, is, without giving too much away really, in essence, a purgatory. And I don't mean that in the Christian, you were 3.6, not great, not terrible, so now roast for a few hundred years and you might get to dance in the clouds after all type, but rather in the literal sense of the word. A space that purges. 
Gloria literally has to undertake a journey into the depths of her psyche to rediscover and unearth aspects about herself that she had long buried under a mountain of trauma and neglect in order to conform to the monumental expectations set upon her by society and her desire to conform to it. It's her quest to rediscover herself as a person whose identity is not built on the quicksand foundation of fleshly or carnal desires in essence, her decarnation, and then hopefully emerge as the phoenix from the ashes with a newfound sense of true self-esteem, hopefully, and somehow find a way out of this terrible prison, both, you know, metaphorically and physically. Yeah, I gotta admit that I had several moments where I started getting my hopes up that maybe because the line between sanity and madness, between reality, imagination and the subconscious was getting so totally blurred that, yeah, maybe this whole thing, her whole abduction and imprisonment was just a figment of imagination after all? Maybe it was all a parable from the start, never really happened, a gigantic id machine and all would be good in the end? Well, I'm of course not going to spoil the conclusion to that, if I was right or not, but man, this game really made me go places in my mind. Now, if I'd have to point out the part about decarnation that felt like the weakest link to me, then it was the occasional puzzles it tossed at the player at somewhat erratic intervals. Like, don't get me wrong, none of the puzzles or the overall use of puzzles in the game in isolation were, like, bad, per se. They were overall well executed, consistently beautifully illustrated and charmingly animated, and for the most part, entertaining enough. I enjoyed most of them, actually. And they were also efficient in breaking up the flow from time to time. My only gripes with the puzzles were that the random placement at times felt a bit erratic and random, and that the game relied way too heavily on stock puzzles. In essence, regurgitations of commonly used video game logic puzzles you've seen repurposed endlessly across many different games. The structure problem to me was that the puzzles are introduced uh, way too late into the game for players to get a feel for what's expecting them. Like, there's not a single actual logic puzzle throughout the entire first chapter, meaning the demo that was given to people to decide if this is a game for them. In that entire prologue, we've only been exposed to simple quick time events and the dancing rhythm game when it comes to interactivity. So someone who plays a demo decides to buy the game based on the expectation it to be an accurate vertical slice and mechanics, but who happens to really not click with lateral thinking challenges and logic puzzles will probably feel a bit slapped in the face when they're suddenly facing a chess-based puzzle of all things not too far into the second chapter in the full game. This puzzle is a common variation of the move chess pieces according to their typical movement patterns into certain spots on the board. So you're not really playing chess, but you're, you know, just moving pieces around like chess pieces and then put them in specific places that is a bit challenging. And I've encountered this type of puzzle so many times in video games by now, ever since The Seventh Guest. And Seventh Guest was a game that was all about stock puzzles. And don't get me wrong, it's not even a particularly difficult version of this type of puzzle, but all I'm saying is if you're somebody who really doesn't resonate with this kind of challenge, you'll likely feel heavily blindsided by it. Probably gonna have to look up a walkthrough or, you know, drop the game altogether. This is quite similar to the game introducing relatively simple and straightforward, but also at times quite challenging and unforgiving stealth sequences against your inner demons, basically. Same thing here, they're fine for what they are, the adversaries are neatly animated and getting caught really can send a jolt up your spine, and they also fit narratively well in the context, but they can definitely be an unexpected roadblock for the less video game savvy player who expects the way more straightforward narrative first experience teased in the demo. And yeah, there's more stock puzzles, like the memory match minigame, you know, the match two cards one where you get shown all the cards at a glance and have to remember pairs. We also get a variation of collect sentences in the correct order and match quotes with the characters that have said them. We have a toggling set piece puzzle where you have different states of floor plates and only one combination that I only figure out by trying every combination is the correct one. And of course we have Simon Says, in my experience one of the most common stock puzzles in video games altogether, which I can't help but criminally offensive side eye whenever I counter yet another version of it. And yeah, don't get me wrong, all of this is really fine most of the time, and quite often they even make sense within the metaphor of Gloria's corroded mental palace. The only times when I felt actually a bit irritated was when I found that one of the puzzles that was supposed to be hard to solve literally cheats you when you get too close to actually solving it. 
I'm quite convinced that the point the game is trying to make is something along the lines of swimming against the current, not following the rules laid out for you by others, etc. Because it is, I believe, the one puzzle that you can, and to my knowledge, have to outright ignore in order to advance. But there's absolutely no signposting for that, which admittedly made me feel a bit shortchanged after I'd put in quite a bit of extra effort to actually solve it, only to find that it's actively cheating you, quantifiably. Feels very unsatisfying. And yeah, towards the end, the game also has to come back on Simon Says of all things and blend it together with the rhythm game mechanics. And given that I, for some reason, kept having a much harder time than I should have to parse the rhythm of the music and the dance segments to begin with, never being able to accurately hit the expected button prompts at all times, imagine doing that while playing repeat the sequence without any visual cues or a musical tag that you can match your prompts to. Yeah. I get that the puzzle is meant to symbolize a state of natural intuition, but when it tells me for the 20th time in a row that my intuition is shite, when I already know the sequence like the back of my hand and keep trying to repeat it as accurately as I feel capable, that was definitely a moment where I ended up feeling quite frustrated for a spell, especially since there was no option to skip it. Like, I'm certainly no MLG Pro Rhythm Gamer, but I did finish a Project Diva song once on highest difficulty with a 100% score, so I can't be that horrible. But hey, I might also suck at it. Would actually love to hear others have been faring with the rhythm game segments if you struggle as much as I to parse the expected rhythm correctly, even though the segments are really not that complicated at all. Like, I kept thinking, Given the challenges put up by the game are so different in kind, from lateral thinking challenges to rhythm games to sometimes quite unforgiving stealth passages to memorization challenges, timing challenges, and so on, given the fact that this is a narrative-heavy game that definitely strongly appeals also to not-so-super video game-savvy audiences, I think it would do itself a great service if you just had an option to skip segments that smack you over the head too many times because it's just not your forte. That's fine. Like, despite Gloria going through an unbelievably tough ordeal across the story and the players being made to empathize with her throughout it, Decarnation really isn't a you didn't grow, you didn't improve kind of game where the sheer impossible odds that have to be overcome through endless trial, error, and improvement are a key part of the game design. Anyway, those were really the only few instances where I personally felt a bit irritated by the puzzles, but it was ultimately nothing that even got remotely close to throwing me off. Besides these few nitpicks, Decarnation had me hooked and effortlessly pulled me along through its roughly six hour long playtime. And yeah, aside from these minor gripes, it keeps being incredibly well-crafted, often really clever in how it uses certain mechanics and techniques. Like, I usually don't enjoy quote-unquote puzzles where you've already looked in the right place from the get-go, but only a bit later does the correct spot in the environment become an interactable. But Decarnation does that a few times when it makes contextually a lot of sense. For instance, when Gloria finds herself in her prison for the first time, trying to search the room for anything that can help her break out when she still has the hope that there is a way out. So the way she gradually starts looking in more and more places is a great way to symbolize her increasingly stressed state of attention through simple game mechanics. Now, to conclude this, as I've said, I've approached this review very much from the top of my head as a flowing stream of consciousness, so pardon if I ended up meandering a bit at times and also omitting a lot of things that I'm probably going to remember in a couple of days when I like, ah, should have added that, you know? There's still a lot of stuff that I'm currently digesting slowly over time when it comes to decarnation and the flurry of emotions it put me through. Like, it's probably hard to imagine, as someone who talks about video games for a living, that I quite often struggle with sticking with games. A regular case of advanced video game ennui, really with growing age and an endless library of games constantly at my fingertips. Not seldom, even a title that I find that was really up my alley end up not continuing after the first session, not because I don't want to, but because getting back into it feels like a weirdly frustrating roadblock for some intangible reason. Decarnation was one of the welcome exceptions of this struggle where I just couldn't wait to get back into it the next day because I was really hooked pretty much from the get-go. I took to the characters, setting, aesthetics, music and pacing pretty much instantly, and especially the arrival in Gloria's prison at the beginning of chapter 2, I just had to keep going. And not just because I wanted to know how or if she can get out of this pickle, but also because it's just a damn beautifully crafted piece of interactive audiovisual art. 
that makes it so apparent just how much blood, sweat, and tears went into its creation. This is clearly a labor of love by a small, passionate team, and considering it's their maiden voyage, it's a seriously impressive achievement. I know decarnation will stick with me for quite some time, and I'm probably gonna revisit it at some point. So thanks for watching. If what you've seen of Decarnation piqued your interest, the game is available on Steam, links in the description. And as I said, there's a free demo on the first chapter that will definitely be super helpful to decide if it'll be something that clicks with you or something that won't. Just know that there's gonna be logic puzzles and stealth passages and some quite hefty stuff to process that's coming up. And of course, thanks again to Atelier QDB for reaching out to me and giving me access to the game and trusting me with this review. Good luck for the launch of the game, and lastly, if you've enjoyed this video in any capacity, please leave a like and comment and consider subscribing if you haven't already. And if you want to see more, I got a whole cartload of indie, horror, and retro game focused videos on my channel, so there's going to be sleepy time ASMR for you for hours on end. Until next time, ta-da!